And now it's time for our U.S. Report regular, former White House Chief of Staff and Senior Advisor at Bondi Partners, Mick Mulvaney. Mick, thanks so much for coming on the program. And I just love this story about Jennifer Granholm's EV because it shows what happens when the left's attempt to create a green climate paradise where they're still the elite, the nomenclatura runs smack back up against the laws of physics. Am I wrong here, or is this a great metaphor yeah. for this administration's approach to just about everything? James, since I'm such a gracious person to my Democrat friends, I'm going to try and find a silver lining here and see how this works out, which is that Please. at least this is them. Yeah, ordinarily, the left is really, really good at telling people to do as they say, not as they do. They would tell you to take an electric car, and she would get nowhere near one. So maybe that's the silver lining here. But no, I think it's fantastic that she gets a chance to see what it's like to actually have an EV. I don't say this publicly to a lot of people, but I guess maybe in Australia I can get away with this. I have an EV, and it's a nightmare. Um, to get the thing charged is, 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 is nearly impossible. The public things are miserable. I bought it because I only drive it about once every month instead of a vacation piece of property. But no, they're, they're, not, they're not as good as, 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 as petrol uh, cars. And it's just, it's so frustrating to have them sit in Washington, D.C. and tell us how to live our lives um, when it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, well, anyway, I was glad she got to experience it firsthand. How about that for putting a, putting a, nice, uh, a nice bow on that one? I think that's a, that's a very graceful and diplomatic way to put it. Of course, note, Mick, that she was driving a Cadillac Lyric, so, you know, she wasn't slumming it in yeah. some, you know, low-end uh, EV yeah, there. I, 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 mine is a, uh, mine's a 2013 Fiat 500e. So uh, a little bit uh, the other end of the uh, economic spectrum. <laughs> well, let's move on to politics, Mick, because the New York Times and the Washington Post have both launched attacks on Joe Biden and his ability to run in 24. Now, I've spoken about this with previous yeah. guests here, and i got to ask you, do you think the message is now going out from the Democratic establishment and which sec segments of the de Democratic establishment that it's time for Biden to simply go out gently, say he's not going to run again, pull an LBJ. Is that the mood in Democratic circles now? Yeah, James, you and I talked about this, if you remember, I don't know, three or four months ago, there was an article in a smaller publication called The Atlantic, which is a very left-wing leaning organization, and they started to talk about this, and you and I had a conversation where we talked about, if it's in The Atlantic, it means it's, it's in the echo chamber. It's being discussed at the cocktail parties in New York City where all the big Democrat donors are. And sure enough, Listen, the Atlantic is one thing. It's hard to explain to folks in Australia exactly how important the Washington Post and the New York Times are to the left in this country. They are the standard bearers for the progressive and the liberal movements here. So for them to have this, and David Ignatius, whose name is not going to be familiar to your listeners or to your watchers, but here in the United States, David Ignatius is one of the leading mouthpieces for the left. So for him to be in the Washington Post saying it's time for Joe Biden to go, and then in the next breath saying Kamala Harris should go as well, is, is th that's an earthquake in Democrat politics here in the United States of America. Yeah, and of course, that brings up the great problem. You know, if Biden is somehow shuffled off stage, they do have that Kamala problem to deal with. And I love the effort by Nancy Pelosi this week to suggest that Kamala might actually be a political powerhouse who's just being held back by the constraints of the job. Have a look at this. But do you think she is the, the best running mate, though? She's the vice president of the United States. So people say to me, well, why isn't she doing this or that? I said, because she's the vice president. That's the job description. You don't do that much. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you know. And as you say, this is a much bigger discussion that's happening. This was part of a larger interview that she did with Anderson Cooper on CNN. Again, this feels to me like there's some real battle space preparation going on here to test the waters. Yeah, there is. She has to say that, by the way. Anytime a, you, you, anybody in any party gets asked about a member of their own party, the vice president, the president, they have to say really nice things about it. No one believes what she just said, including her. And I say that because it was in, again, the Washington Post editorial today saying that, Nant, that they think that, uh, that Kamala Harris should stand aside in addition to Joe Biden standing aside into the next, next election cycle. So what we're hearing now in Washington is this, is the timing. Now that it's out in the open, now that it's an open discussion, should Biden leave? Then the next question is, when should Biden leave? And the things that I'm hearing uh, in, in town, uh, James, are that they're going to wait until after the convention. Because if they do it now, they have to have a primary. They have to have a race. They have to have an election. 
But after Joe Biden gets the nomination at the convention in the summer of 2024, then the party leaders would get to choose who the replacement is. They could hand pick somebody. How they don't pick Kamala Harris, I haven't figured that out yet. How you bypass an African-American woman, I, I, I don't understand how they're gonna do that. But that's the scuttlebutt here in Washington, D.C., is that they wait until next summer so they don't have to have an open primary. So, Mick, though, this, you know, like people talk about places that are called a People's Democratic Republic where they're none of the above. And this here sounds like the Democratic Party is actually not being very democratic at all if they're going to wind up basically subverting the primary process, not letting Robert F. Kennedy really have a shot. And then the big wigs are going to get together in a back room and pick who it is. Do you think Democrats will stand for that sort of treatment to say, oh, look, here's the guy we've anointed. Here's your person to be Trump. Yeah, yeah, 100 percent for a variety. Why do I say that? Without hesitation, I can say that. Um, number one, because most of the media in this country will be in the bag for them and they won't drive that narrative. Fox News in this country will, the Wall Street Journal will, but the liberals don't read those anyway. So when the media is in the bag for you, you can get away with a lot of stuff. Why am I even more comfortable saying that? Which is because they've done this. This is how the Democrat primaries work. This is not well known even in the United States of America. The Democrats still use a tool called super delegates. The leaders of the party actually get more than one vote when it comes to nominating and uh, nominating a, a candidate at the Democrat National Convention. So this whole idea even of one person, one vote is already out the window with the Democrat Party and has been for a long time. This is, this is what Hillary Clinton was counting on when she was running against Barack Obama, that if she had enough of the mm. superdelegates, it didn't make any difference how the primary went because they still were going to pick her. So this, that, that, that concept is already hardwired into the system and the Democrats will, will take it hook, line and sinker without complaint. So Mick, just finally real quick, if not Kamala, who? I don't know. I guess it's Gavin Newsom, the governor of California. I don't know why they think a progressive uh, white male governor in California is going to be the, the, the savior of their party. I don't know how they're going to, to spin getting rid of the highest elected African-American woman in history. I don't know. But here's what I do know is that they, counting on, uh, they were counting on Joe Biden to do one thing and one thing only, and that was beat Donald Trump. And as soon as they decide that he can't do that, then he's gone. And I think they've come to that decision this week. Mick Mulvaney, interesting times ahead. Thank you so much for joining us.